Hello, welcome, or welcome back, to this multi-part series, Autism Spectrum Disorder in Three Dimensions. My name is James Copeland, MD, and I will be your host, or perhaps more correctly, I will be your guide to this material. As I outlined in the initial post, this series will cover four broad areas. First, what is autism spectrum disorder? Second, what causes ASD? Third, what can we expect? And fourth, what can we do? As I mentioned last time, even though ASD has been the subject of discussion for well over a hundred years, it remains a condition defined by its outwardly visible behavior rather than some underlying medical or biological marker. There is no medical test for ASD, unlike, for example, uh, pregnancy or chickenpox, um, which have specific causes and uh, for which we can test. Uh, there is no specific medical test for ASD. Rather, we need to look at the behaviors, and if those form a particular picture, then we say that the individual has autism spectrum disorder. So, given the fact that ASD is defined by a constellation of behaviors, it becomes very important to know exactly what those behaviors are. And in order to gain a perspective on the current uh, behavioral definition of ASD, I think it will be very instructive to go back and look at how we got to where we are today, because there's an unfortunate tendency every time there's a newly published set of diagnostic criteria to um, argue about those or fasten on those and decide that those are the be-all and the end-all and the last word, when in fact um, this is something that's been open to a little bit of discussion for a long time. And we're going to begin tonight's discussion by reviewing the contributions of a gentleman you may or may not have heard of, or if you've heard of him, probably not within the context of autism. And that's an English physician by the name of Langdon Down. If his name sounds familiar to you, it's because he's the person after whom Down syndrome was named because he was the first to describe it. And we'll get to that in a minute. The other two people whose names loom large in any discussion of the behavioral criteria for autism spectrum disorder are an Austrian physician by the name of Hans Asperger and an American physician by the name of Leo Connor. And then our discussion would be not complete if we didn't talk about the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, in which a uh, group of individuals have attempted to collate and filter and refine the clinical criteria uh, into um, a diagnostic framework. So Langdon Down, who uh, lived from 1828 to 1896, in some ways is my professional ancestor. He lived in a time when there was no such thing as pediatrics. There were physicians who took care of uh, individuals of all ages. There was not a, a recognized subspecialty of pediatrics until the early 20th century. Uh, but Langdon Down was unusual among his colleagues in that he took a particular interest in children, and within the group of the universe of children, he was particularly interested in uh, working with and helping uh, the lives of children with developmental disabilities. Now, Langdon Down lived, uh, as I've said, uh, his entire life in the 19th century, and I just want to give you some historical context for what life was like in England at that time. And this is a picture of Victoria Regina et Imperatrix, meaning she was the Queen of England and the Empress of India. 
She lived from 1819 to 1901, and she ruled from 1837 until her death in 1901. Here we have a picture of what, at the time it was founded, was called the Asylum for Idiots. Now, the terms imbecile, or rather moron, imbecile, and idiot were the three terms that were conventionally used for what was eventually uh, rebranded or rechristened as mild, moderate, and severe to profound mental retardation. And then again, the wheel has turned, so now it's mild, moderate, and severe to profound intellectual disability. But the terms moron, imbecile, and idiot were not terms of derision in the mid-19th century. They were simply the descriptive terms that were being used. And this building, the Asylum for Idiots, which was established in 1854, was a huge step forward because it was intended to be um, a place where the needs of individuals with developmental disabilities were put first. Prior to then, uh, people with mental illness and people with developmental disability had been incarcerated um, in the same institutions. It was a snake pit, uh, it was vile, but um, the Asylum for Idiots was actually funded in part uh, by the London Upper Crust, Queen Victoria herself made a contribution of 250 guineas. A guinea is 21 shillings. I don't know what that's worth in today's dollars, but it was a not insubstantial amount, and many of the other subscribers were also among the well-to-do um, of English society. And Langdon Down was the superintendent at the Asylum for Idiots from 1855 to 1868. I might add, and you see it on the screen, that it was renamed the Royal Earlswood Institution for Mental Defectives in 1926, and it was finally closed in 1997. Today, I believe it's apartment houses or apartment units. Now, another piece of historical context that it's important for you to put under your belt is that Darwin published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life, a rather melodramatic subtitle, and this was published in 1859. Shortly thereafter, Francis Galton, one of Darwin's cousins, propounded the theory of social Darwinism, i.e., um, as he saw it, there was an inherent superiority of the white race. The white race was the most um, uh, well-developed, and this was used as, in his mind, and this was used as a way of buttressing English imperialism and providing it with a pseudoscientific um, justification. He was the one who coined the term eugenics, which took the meaning of helping Mother Nature along by promoting the breeding of, quote, fitter, more fit persons and discouraging or preventing breeding by less fit persons. And if this sounds vaguely familiar to you, it should. Uh, this is a Nazi propaganda poster from the 1930s entitled Fertility and Race, the Growth of the Slav in Europe. And what it shows uh, is Germany and its uh, ethnic composition, so said, so stated by the Nazi propaganda machine in 1810 that shows approximately one-third as German stock, you see this uh, fair-haired, uh, fair-skinned individual, one-third roughly uh, Ro Roman or Italianate, Mediterranean, and then another third Slavic. And then by 1930, because of the supposed either in-migration or being outbred by uh, Slavs and Romanians, you see that the proportion of uh, the Nordic or Aryan um, variant of Germans has diminished. It's now about a quarter. It's, over here it was a third. And then the projected outcome uh, for 1960, as projected in the 1930s, shows a Slavic predominance. And you can even see here the way the Nazi propagandists drew this person. He's got these uh, almond-shaped eyes, which they might as well have said Mongolian as opposed to Slavic. But you can see the idea. So this this idea was deeply entrenched that people of from the Far East were somehow inherently uh, deficient uh, compared to Anglo-Saxons or Aryans, have, have it as you will. 
So now we jump back to the year 1866. Now we put Langdon down back into context, and he publishes this paper, Observations on an Ethnic Classification of Idiots. Among the large number of idiots and imbeciles, remember, moron, idiot, and imbecile were the terms that were used. Among the large number of idiots and imbeciles that have come under my observation, a considerable portion can be fairly referred to one of the great divisions of the human family, other than the class from which they have sprung. He was an Englishman, very conscious of class. Other than the class from which they have sprung, a very large number of idiots are congenital Mongols. So marked is this that when placed side by side, it is difficult to believe that the specimens, i.e. the children, the specimens compared are not children of the same parents. And he drew attention to the remarkable physical similarities in individuals that he described as having, quote unquote, Mongolism or Mongoloid idiocy. And um, these are textbook descriptions. The descriptions of the physical features are still valid today. The so-called almond-shaped eyes, low-set posterior hairline, um, single solitary uh, palmer crease, which you can see in the diagram a little better than here. Often um, what are called brush field spots in the eyes. There are typical cardiac lesions, low set ears, low tone, and all of these things go together to form a clinical description of what was called Mongol, Mongolian idiocy or Mongolism. And even when I trained in medical school, the term Mongolism was still fairly common. It was not until the year 1959, nearly a hundred years after Langdon Down published his description, that the chromosomal makeup was finally figured out. In fact, the human genome, human uh, chromosomal complement was not worked out until the 50s. And then Lejeune and, co and colleagues in 1959 pinpointed the fact that all of these individuals who look so much alike have an extra copy of chromosome number 21. We have 23 pair of chromosomes adding up to 46, but these individuals have 47. Typically there are exceptions, which we don't have to go into for this uh, presentation, but uh, typically they have an extra chromosome number 21. So it's called trisomy for three of chromosome 21. And now we refer to this condition as trisomy 21. Even the term Down syndrome is going somewhat out of favor because there's more of a tendency to use technical descriptions rather than eponyms based upon the name of the person who described it. So this was a huge uh, contribution descriptively by Langdon Down, even though he was barking up the wrong tree in terms of etiology, and he was betraying or he was reflecting the mindset of his day of racial superiority of Anglo-Saxons and racial inferiority of uh, people of Far Eastern descent. Now, he didn't stop there. In 1887, he published a book, and I have a copy of it right here in front of me. It's a reproduction, unfortunately, not the original but it's entitled On Some of the Mental Affectations of Children and Youth, being the Letsomian Lectures delivered before the Medical Society of London in 1887, together with other papers by J. Langdon Down, M.D., London. And this is where Langdon Down enters the story of ASD. And we begin here. We pick up on page 14, of Down's um, monograph in which he had already described um, children with Down syndrome. And then he goes on to say, I have alluded already to a group which I have ventured to describe as quote unquote accidental. They are children who were born or ready to be born with all of the potentiality of intelligence, but whose brain becomes damaged. In these cases, there is no outward sign of mental vacuity no hereditary taint to mar the beauty of his visage. In other words, these are not children who look like the kids with Down syndrome. They don't have what we would call today dysmorphic features, which he, in, in his terms, called hereditary taint. And let's look at how he describes these children. They are bright in their expression, often active in their movements, 
agile to a degree, mobile in their temperament, fearless as to danger, persevering in mischief, petulant to have their own way. Their language is one of gesture only. Living in a world of their own, they are regardless of the ordinary circumstances around them and yield only to the counter fascination with music and the underlinings uh, I have added. He continues, these are the cases in which mothers entertain the strongest hope. I cannot enforce too strongly grave caution in the prognosis which should be given in such cases. He continues, I know of nothing more painful than the long motherly expectancy of speech, how month after month the hopes are kept at high tension, waiting for the prattle which never comes, how the self-contained and self-absorbed little one cares not to be entertained other than in his own dreamland and by automatic movements of his fingers or rhythmical movements of his body. Notice how often the, uh, pronoun, the pronoun is a he rather than a she, although he does describe some girls as he goes along. Even when speech does exist, it is often echo-like. Consider, these were observations Langdon Down made in 1855 that he published in 1887. Even when speech does exist, it is often echo-like. To my question, how are you today, came the immediate reply, today. I asked another, are you a good girl? The response is simply, girl. Sometimes the whole question is repeated and the echo is not simply that of the last word. Well, this could be written about any of my patients uh, when I was in clinical practice. Continuing, he writes, they live entirely in a world of their own. How many parents have said that to me? They do not listen with a childlike curiosity to the conversation which is going on in their presence. They hear what is said, but they do not attend nor can their attention be arrested except by diverting them into new channels by a more attractive trail. They usually have great intensity of purpose and succeed in having their own way, the mothers having given up the contest for the sake of peace. Automatic movements are also very common. These may include rhythmical movements of the fingers before the eyes. And then he talks about a subclass he says, this is a convenient place to treat of an interesting class of cases for which the term idio savant, a French term, has been given. This name has been applied to children who, while feeble-minded, exhibit special faculties, which are capable of being cultivated to a very great extent. One youth, James Henry Pullen, we'll get to him in a minute, one youth who was under my care could build exquisite model ships from drawings, and carve with a great deal of skill, who yet could not understand a sentence. Another who can draw in crayons with marvelous skill and feeling, in whom nevertheless there was a comparative blank in all higher faculties of the mind. And James Henry Pullen was known as the genius of Earlswood Asylum, now uh, commonly regarded as having been an autistic savant, spent years carving individual ship's models, and he would make all the tools and carve these down to an exquisite level of detail, but um, his social interactions and his verbal skills were marginal at best, and in, in most ways that we can glean from the descriptions, he would qualify uh, for a uh, description as an autistic savant. Down continues, Extraordinary memory is often met with, in other words, accompanied by associated very great defect of reasoning power. A boy came under my observation who, having once read a book, could evermore remember it. I discovered, however, that it was a simple process of verbal adhesion. I love that phrase, verbal adhesion. I once gave him Gibbon's Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. This was a ponderous, multi-volume uh, history of the Roman Empire. I gave him Gibbon's Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire to read. This he did, and on reading the third page, he skipped a line, found out his mistake, and retraced his steps. And ever after, when reciting from memory the stately periods of Gibbon, he would, on coming to the third page, skip the line and go back and correct the error with as much regularity 
as if it had been part of the regular text. In other words, the child was reading from memory, and as he was reciting it from memory, he would build in that original error in his reading and recite that as if it were part of the original text. We've all seen this. Often, Dan continued, the memory takes the form of remembering dates and past events. One boy never fails to be able to tell me the name and address of every confectioner's shop he has visited in London, and there have been numerous, as he can readily tell the date of every visit. And this is just a picture of Mr. Sims' old sweet shop, which is one of the uh, favorite um, old confectioner's stores in downtown London. So, let's consider Langdon Down's paper, 1887, based on his observations at the Earlswood Asylum from the 1850s. And what did he describe? Social isolation. He used the phrase in their own world. We still use that phrase today. Delayed or absent speech, or when speech is present, echolalia. He didn't use the word echolalia. He called it echo-like speech, but it's the same thing. Repetitive handed body movements, which today we would call stereotypies. Repetitive interests and intensity of purpose. Excellent rote memory. Savant skills for dates and locations. And then he also described a range of severity and an absence of outward physical clues. In other words, normal visage. So if you adjust for the flowery language from Victorian England, what he's really giving us is not so different from what's in the DSM today. So the question is, in my mind, why have we forgotten or overlooked Langdon Down? Well, one reason may be that he uh, was kind of tarred uh, with the brush of uh, eugenics and social Darwinism because he was the one who um, offered the theory of mongoloid idiocy. So he, he may have suffered somewhat in people's minds because of his affiliation with that attribution for Down syndrome. But I think a bigger reason may lie in the fact that World War I, which resulted in millions of deaths uh, in Europe, um, represented a tremendous uh, disruption in uh, social and scientific continuity. He didn't give it a name. Unlike uh, mongoloid idiocy, which was an unfortunate name, he didn't give this a name. And perhaps, most of all, he was simply ahead of his time. And I think another reason that we, have, um, we don't think of him is that he was not given credit where it was due later on. And I'm just going to wrap up today's post, which has gone on longer than I thought it might, to say, well, time passes, and we're going to make a jump from 1887 to 1943-44. And as a mini preview, next time we're going to talk about Leo Connor and his 1943 paper, Autistic Disturbances of Affective Contact. And we're going to talk about Hans Asperger. And don't ask me to pronounce this in German uh, because I don't speak or read German, but you can see that it has the words Autistic Psychopathology in it. And you'll notice the publication date of this is June 3rd, 1944. And my little uh, quiz question for you is, what happened three days later? And we will talk about uh, Asperger and Connor a great deal more next week. I hope you will agree with me that after this review of Langdon Down's description, that he was talking about the same thing that we're talking about today when we refer to autism spectrum disorder. And the take-home message from that is that ASD is not a new condition by any stretch of the imagination. Next week, we'll have more to say about Asperger and Connor and their contributions to the field. And I'll also introduce you to two people whose names you have probably never heard of before. So stay tuned, and I'll see you in another week. Thanks.